Hey everyone, you're listening to InfoQuench with Jeff and Amy. We're chatting about how to get the most out of life and covering a ton of interesting topics. So there's sure to be something for just about everyone. Let's get to it. Hey everybody and welcome to InfoQuench. I'm your host Jeff. And I'm Amy and this episode is going to be on how to be more zen. More zen. Or how I, I like to refer to it as more Jeff-like. What if you're already Zen? Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. I'd say I'm 80% Zen. You can always be more. 20% chaos. You could be more Zen. So is this like Zen as in Zen Buddhist uh, perspective on things? Or are we going to, we're going to get into that, aren't we? We are. Well, it's more around the idea of peaceful, calm demeanor and lifestyle as opposed to a very strict Zen Buddhism practice. Okay, that makes sense. We're just focusing on the calm. I like that. I like that. And I got a lot of the content for this episode from a great website called Zen Habits. Uh, If you haven't checked it out, you should. They've got some great blogs on there. And I actually want to start out early on with the quote that inspired this episode. And it is a quote from a great book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persig. And the quote is, the only Zen you find on tops of mountains is the Zen you bring there. Ah, yes. Yes. That's true. That's a, that was a great book, too, by the way. I read that a long time ago. It was one of the first books you recommended to me when we started dating. Yes, that's right. And, and yeah, you read I, it right straight away. I did. You wanted to learn more about me. That's true. You also <laughs> lent me American Psycho. Oh, yeah, that's right. I did. <laughs> that's right. I did. What a, what a weird book to give somebody when you're trying I, to, hey, read this. This, this guy's just like me. You are very eclectic in your uh, enjoyment <laughs> of literature. Luckily, I didn't take the uh, American Psycho too seriously. To mean seriously. anything. No, exactly. It was just a book. But it was it really was well written. It was just a book. I'm still alive. <laughs> still alive to record this podcast with you. Yeah. But the idea around that quote is, you know, it's Zen isn't something you find. We often try to think about ways to escape. And I think it's great to connect with nature and go to places in, in the world that do give you a sense of calm and peace. But really, when we talk about Zen, we're talking about that inner calm. And that's something that you can carry with you regardless of your environment or your circumstances. So that's what we're going to cover in this episode is just some tips or things that you can think about as you go through your daily life to be a little more zen right so you, everybody's got that zen inside and they just need to tap into it right and some of the stuff people may be doing already but give it some thought and maybe work on adding a little more of it to your life and the first thing is just around single tasking so the idea of focusing on one thing at a time oh yes in a culture that is very much about the grind and trying to fit as much into our day as possible we can get caught up in multitasking and lose the ability to focus on a single task and there's actually a zen proverb that goes when walking walk when eating eat so the idea is to focus on what you're actually doing don't, right don't let your mind wander on to other things or or try to uh, attempt to do multiple aren't things you a little once. advanced though if you can walk and eat isn't and that chew the gum? ultimate in zen? i think it's the chewing of the gum yeah sure you can chew gum too yeah but you I'm can't in thinking... singapore well, no. You, well, you can. You just can't throw it on the ground. That's right. Throw you in the slammer. Is that true, or is that is that? That's like illegal. A, it's okay. A, yeah, it is I've illegal. heard that before, but I didn't know if it was one it's of those. It's illegal myths. to even bring chewing gum into the country, as far as I understood. Like mm-hmm. not just putting it on the ground. All right. So the next is <laughs> when you're doing these single tasks, is to do them slowly and deliberately. So don't rush, you know, take your time, move through it slowly. And, uh, you know, one of the tasks that I often hear people say is meditative is washing dishes. Yeah, I've heard that too. I, I don't I don't see that. No, anymore. I don't find it. I actually find it very satisfying to load a dishwasher to perfection. Yeah, you do that every day. I what know. what is what is uh, an action that is meditative besides the dishwasher for well, you? Like for me, yeah, walking like is definitely walking, meditative. Walk, walking is great actually. For me it's like making art like painting or something like that i get into a zone and it's it is very zen like i would say because you kind of shut off your mind and you just go at least that's how i do it well i think a lot of times people are drawn to hobbies and in their free time that are meditative in nature, repetitive things that calm their mind. I've been enjoying puzzling, as I talked about on recent episodes. And that is definitely something that is, uh, 
you know, just really focuses your thoughts on, on one thing. It's amazing to see how you break down how to tackle a puzzle. Like how you're like, I got to get all the words over here. Then I got to get all the blue over here. I mean, I guess that's pretty much how everybody does puzzles. I just don't really do puzzles I don't know. very much. I think some people just sit down and enjoy them. I look at them <laughs> and try to think of the most efficient way to make it. And every puzzle is different depending yeah. on the design. And, you know, some you tackle the patterns a little bit. Because you do two things at once sometimes. You do the border as well as flip over all the pieces. Well, yes. You've got to sort while you're flipping. You it know, makes, sort while you flip. There's no other way to do that, really, that no. makes sense from an efficiency standpoint. Because you'd just be wasting time. <laughs> not zen at all. <laughs> so the idea, you know, not don't rush through a task. We, we were watching an episode of House Hunters recently. House Hunters International is one of my favorite. On HGTV. H- I love HGTV. I have you dreams do. of living in some foreign land uh, and you know years down the road for even you With know a beach. 6 month period yeah, and it has to be near a beach, higher up so that I don't have to deal with bugs and snakes and such. High enough up that I don't even have to deal with mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I digress. There were, we were watching it and a couple were they were looking at apartments and I don't know if it was in Paris or was in a city and the husband was adamant that he did not want a dishwasher because he loved doing dishes so much. Yeah, that's very rare, I think. I found that odd. I know some other people who really enjoy doing dishes as well. And I I never really understood it. Like, they love doing it. I mean, there are things to enjoy. I remember reading uh, in one of those, like, one of the earliest books I read was, like, that kitchen or chicken noodle soup for the... What is it called? For the soul? (laughs) Chicken soup for the soul? It's not noodle? It's not chicken noodle soup? I don't know. It's good for your noodle, I guess. (laughs) Anyway, there's a story in there about doing dishes and how it feels really great to... Feel the warmth of the water and, you know, and not to be afraid to take that stuff out of the bottom of the sink, you know, oh. all, the, all the food. Oh, I hate that gathers stuff. there. I hate that stuff. I hate it's it when people life, don't scrape though. their plates enough and oh, all those things. Yeah. It's, I found, what I found strange about that, the man who wanted a place without a dishwasher is why couldn't there, why couldn't a dishwasher still exist and he could do the dishes yeah. Still by hand. I don't understand why, why he needed it was like one it, not to be in the house. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I do like, not want that dishwasher. If it's there, I have to use it. It'll be beyond my I control. Think it's, yeah, I think that's why. I think it's because if the dishwasher was there, then slowly he would watch his Zen moment die. And just and then he would be like all uh, mechanized. Yes. Great word, Jeff. Yeah, I had to think about that one for a second. <laughs> we had a friend who was really had a clever idea of having two dishwashers and only having enough dishes that would fill a dishwasher. And essentially, you'd run one, you'd run your dishwasher, and you'd use all the clean dishes out of that dishwasher and just keep them stored there as you're using them. And as they're dirty, put them into the second dishwasher and then not need cupboard space. Wow, that's like that. That's not privilege at all. <laughs> Wow. Mess will have two or three ovens too and you know <laughs> five fridges. No, it makes sense though. I well, I don't it know. does sound privileged though. You well know, you don't have, have but you don't have to have any cabinets. No, I know. Which are really expensive. Yeah. I don't know if they're more expensive than dishwashers. But anyway, I digress. Um If you are doing a task, do it completely, you know, make sure that you finish what you're working on before you moved on to the next thing. And, you know, there are times when you don't always have that option. Like, for instance, if you're in a a situation where there's an urgent item that comes up and you need to address it, you have to move between items. But ideally, if you're doing a task, finish that one up, put everything away. You know, even if you're making a meal, clean up after yourself and then go down sit down at the table and eat you know Jeff, what i find pretty zen you well, hold on before we leave oh, that one go ahead, go you ahead. often when, when you're eating a meal and i and i look at the kitchen i as soon as i walk out you're like i'm gonna clean it when i'm done i just didn't want my food to get cold that happens all the time <laughs> I know. then i do i do clean it don't you sit here and say i don't clean it but i'm no i'm not i'm not saying that i just actually have a hard time enjoying my meal when i know that the, the, the oh, no, kitchen I, is dirty i'd prefer to have everything put away and i'm then not I don't gonna have... i i'm not i mean i'm trying to get better at clean as you go but if the if there's like a mess from cleaning a meal or making a meal i'm not gonna let my food get cold while i clean the kitchen and then and not enjoy my meal but you don't mind letting the condiments rot on the counter they don't rot it's like 
10 or 15 minutes. It doesn't take that long to eat. <laughs> Rot. Yeah. <laughs> the carry. But no, but I was just going to say that, you know, you, there's, there's talk about doing being Zen with one, uh, you know, thing at a time. But sometimes it's kind of nice to do that little challenge where it's like you look at the kitchen and you're like, I, okay, I have two, two objectives here. I want to clean the kitchen and I want to like cook something. You know, it goes back to what we were just talking. Well, about. yes. So how how do you like balance like how you like you, you you look at the whole situation and then you're like, OK, I can put the ketchup away while I go over here and get this pot because the pot's right by the ketchup and blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, you can just like you can get right Zen into that. You know what I'm talking about? Well, it's true. Mm-hmm. I, I get a, a lot of satisfaction out of finding efficiencies. And I think that's a perfect example of efficiency. So wherever you get your pleasure. Do it Wait up. a minute. I think your efficiency is a dirty kitchen that your husband left for you, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I do not do that. Anyway. No, no. Sorry. I hate to paint you in a bad light, Jeff. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> no, I'm my, my, next, uh, my next tip around how to be more zen is to just put space between things. And what I mean by things, I mean, you know, activities. Don't put everything back to back. Don't schedule Uh, one thing straight after another without leaving any wiggle room. One of the biggest changes that I made that makes a difference in my day is to allow myself more time in the morning. Yeah. Just getting up a little bit earlier so that my morning isn't rushed and I very much remember those rushed mornings and they 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 weren't pleasant for you. And they weren't pleasant for anyone else. (laughs) (laughs) I think that was more so though when our son was yeah. younger because there was always more prep work anybody who has a young child will can relate that even though you may plan a lot of extra time it just takes a so much time to get out of the house for it whatever does. reason there's yeah. always so many things you need to pack but you know even in my work schedule i do plan f- to leave time between things so for instance if you have a meeting that you know you need to commute to well, as soon as the mood meeting is booked into your calendar, book 15 minutes prior so yeah. it's blocked off to get to the meeting. If you have a, a meeting that you know routine, routinely is going to run long, then mm-hmm. book an overflow period directly after that meeting so that you don't get booked back to back and, and mm-hmm. have that rush. The true Zen thing in all of that would be not to go to any meetings <laughs> and just sit on the beach all day <laughs> that contemplating. Would, wouldn't the that be ideal? Horizon. Yeah, it would. <laughs> But I think a lot of times when you're talking about meetings too, that or any activity that, that you want a little time to digest what's happened afterward, to to you know gather your thoughts and and really uh, get prepared for whatever is coming next. So if you don't have any gaps in your day to do that, yeah, I think it just really leads to less productivity. And I just want to talk quickly about rituals too. I mean, rituals can give you a sense of calm. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of the things when we're talking about mornings is to make coffee, to take time to make coffee manually. I used to always have instant coffee, which made my coffee connoisseur friends just cringe. And then probably about a year ago, I invested in a grinder. Yeah. By I say I invested. I think you bought it for me. I did buy it for you. (laughs) For me saying, lamenting that I wanted one for years. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You finally got me one because I wouldn't go out and buy it. And now I thoroughly enjoy taking the few minutes. I I actually open up the bag of coffee beans and smell them before I put them (laughs) into the grinder and grind the beans. And then, and our son Hux wants to grind the beans, but I won't let him because I really like to do it myself. (laughs) And (laughs) that's being a team player, (laughs) but it's a ritual for me. And that in and of itself is just a moment of stability. And I can understand that There, there are, I think everybody has these rituals that they love doing. Like for me, it's putting on a record, you know, you, t- you, you, you take time to select it, you know, you open it up, you, you look at it, you clean it, you put it on the turntable, you know, you, you have to manually move the arm over and drop it down on the record. I mean, it, it's definitely a ritual. You have to do that with every single record. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, when you say that, I, I do watch you do that and it is very, would you say that you do it in the same order or this exact same order every time? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just, it ha- kind of has to be in a way. Like it really yeah. does. You can't put the needle down before the record. <laughs> yeah. You can't put the needle down on the record before you get the record out of the stacks. And you can't, you know, put the record onto the record player before you've removed it from the sleeve. Yeah. And another, yes, exactly. 
And another ritual, while you're puzzling, I'm DJing for Amy to see if she likes particular music. You're really enjoying that lately. I do. I it's like it. you have a captive audience that I know, you can DJ like, for. Yes. I have my puzzle and table have, set up by the record player, and that's yeah. that's what goes down. And I have gotten you, because like, we don't really like listen to too many records like as a family. But right. when you're doing, when you're puzzling, you're you're stuck. You're there. You're stuck. You you can't leave. Get chained to my puzzling chair. And you're have my to music to prisoner. Jazz. Yeah. Now you play some good tunes. You like the the Bill Callahan that I played. You're yes. like, I get it now. You didn't get it at first, and you're like, I get it now. It's like music with poetry. I'm like, yeah. Oh you got yeah. it. And then I put on some Leonard Cohen. You're like, yeah. Some of the like best this. songs are poems first. Yeah. There's a poem, uh, Always a Woman. And I remember that oh, being yeah. in a book of poetry that my Aunt Marn had when I was growing up. And I had loved that poem so much I'd memorize it. And then I remember hearing the song and I was just blown away that it was a song too. So yeah, I think some of the best songs come first from poems. Yeah. I thought the, I thought the traffic would be quieter because we've had a really nice... Well, that nice was just l- the, the plow oh, going okay. by once. We've had a really nice snowfall today and it does mute the sounds yeah. of the city traffic the the white with the quiet majesty of a winter landscape i'm trying to quote national lampoons <laughs> oh yes that's right yeah. <laughs> when he's uh that's a ritual his... that's yes. a, that's a christmas ritual that we watch that movie every year with your folks another thing you can do is just to repeat a mantra you know it could be as simple as while you're walking you can repeat in your head walking and it's the idea of keeping your thoughts from racing away you for know, me that would just focusing. be remembering what i'm doing I'm just walking, joking. walking to the store. Walking, walking, Keep walking, eating. Jeff. Keep eating walking. now. <laughs> Change walking to eating. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> My mantra in the morning is get your boots on, Hux. Get your boots on. Oh, get I know. Get your boots on. Come on, the bus is coming. Let's go. <laughs> the bus is coming. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this moves us on to our definition for this episode, which is Zazen. Zazen. Z-A, Z-E-N. No idea what that means. Or for our American friends... Z A Z E N. Actually, I don't know where in the world they say Z and versus Z, but we I'm say Z- that here, do we? I'm a Zer. You're Z. What do you say? Uh, I said Z too as well. Yeah. yeah, it's literally it means seated meditation. So according to Wikipedia, because that's where I go for all my Zen Buddhist wisdom. Yes, is it's considered part of the uh, Japanese Buddhist practice, and the aim of it is just to suspend judgmental thinking, letting go of words and ideas and thoughts, and just letting them pass without getting involved in them. Oh, interesting. So to be more Zen, you can devote time to sitting, but really meditation can be part of any you know, rhythmic activity that you're doing during the day. Just a few days ago, I was going to the regional hospital to meet a family member who was coming in by ambulance transport. And uh, it was an urgent situation, not an emergency, but it was an urgent situation. So, and when I got there, I wasn't allowed into the hospital. The security guard said that I needed to call and uh, speak with somebody who was manning the phones within the department itself before they could let me into the building. And so I, I did that. I called and the person hadn't arrived by ambulance yet. And they told me that they basically needed to be registered and inside a room before I was allowed to enter the facility, even though I was their, you know, their primary support person. And so I had to go and sit in my car and I was told to call back 10 minutes later to find out if the ambulance had arrived and it hadn't. And I called back another 10 minutes later and it had arrived, but he, uh, the guy on the phone said, you know, it hadn't the registration hadn't gone through yet. Right. And I had to call back another 10 minutes later and they said, well, they're still not in the room yet. <laughs> Anyways, this went on probably until I got up to about an hour time frame where That's I was frustrating. sitting in my car. And, well, you know, I could have let frustration get the best of me, but mm-hmm. this is the uh, where I use the idea of paradigm shift. And I use this all the time when I'm dealing with a situation that could be potentially frustrating. So I thought to myself, The security guard obviously is just doing their job, their role, and it's to basically be, you know, the gate, the safe, the safe gate to keep, uh, keep COVID out of the building. And the person who was answering the phone was really probably just checking a computer monitor on status, had absolutely no control over what the status of a patient would be. Not just fielding your calls either. 
and by making sure that I wasn't allowed to enter the building until the patient was in the room. They were keeping traffic out of the hallway. So my loved one was in the hallway waiting. And yeah. I was thankful that there weren't a bunch of family members of other patients milling around because that's a chance for transmission. Absolutely. And eventually I called, you know, in these 10 minute increments and I was told, no, now it'll be at least an hour. And Again, that's something that could have become very frustrating. But in my mind, I thought, okay, something, you know, there must be quite an emergency that's occurred that's entered into the emergency department. And they know now that there's going to be a longer wait. Yeah. And, you know, everything worked out okay. Uh, my, my loved one was treated, got home safely, uh, you know, and all protocols were maintained. But I think the, you know, my long story is... The paradigm shift. It's that paradigm shift. And also, you know, as I was sitting in the parking lot, I just took the time to sit. You taught that to me a while back, only on a smaller scale, like when I would get, you know, slight road rage when I was driving or whatever, when someone was driving erratically or something like that or going too fast. Be like, well, maybe they're going too fast because they're, you know, rushing to the hospital for an emergency and stuff like that. You never know. They might not just be yahoos going yes. too fast. Sometimes they are yahoos. Sometimes they are. <laughs> There's Sometimes a lot of yahoos, are. but if you if you picture in your mind that you know there may be something more dire going on, I think it helps you deal with the situation more. And yeah. you know, as I sat there in my car, I thought I'm lucky enough, I'm fortunate enough to have a warm car to sit in. Mm -hmm. I'm also fortunate enough to have a loved one who's in for an urgent scenario, but not an emergency situation. And I can imagine other people sitting in their cars, maybe with somebody who is going through a heart attack or a yeah. matter of life or limb, which would be triage at a higher level, but not having access, you know, to get to them. So and the overall thing was it was fortunate. It was all part of how yep. we protect our healthcare system and we, yeah and that's the thing we wouldn't we didn't have to pay for that that uh, situation well you know, I, I, I often think about that when we're in a hospital situation is that how lucky we are as Canadians to yep. not also be thinking about the bills that might be attached to that care because yep. that would just be an added stress in a time of already heightened stress agreed so I think as humans in today's day and age we've lost the ability to sit whether we're sitting in a waiting room sitting on a bus yeah we feel like we need to continually look at our phones and we don't just sit and take the time to think and so i actually took that time just to sit and that, think that totally reminds me of. of the character in uh, the white uh what was the name of that oh the, the white, white lotus the i think white we lotus? need to talk about the white the lotus a little the kid that all oh, that like that disconnected from his phone and stuff like that and sat on a chair and saw a whale. I'm not giving anything away, but he's like you know he saw a whale and was awed by it. So he had this Zen moment. Well, spoiler alert: there's a whale. Well, it's not <laughs> going to change the narrative at all in any way. <laughs> the white the white lotus. What was that on? Is it an HBO? HBO? Yeah. A, a great little series, six episodes. Uh, I think it's renewed for a second season. I have a yeah. feeling that sort of each season is its own story based on uh, just how it's sort of framed up at, at a resort, looking at the people who are staying at the resort during a certain time frame, and then there's the staff that yeah. are you know, uh, there as well, and everybody's individual stories, and a lot of quirky personalities, lots of great acting. So It's insane, though. I, it's insane how they create this uh atmosphere of suspense just from like nothing really super suspenseful is happening but it's the dialogue it's like the build-up the like it's just it's really really well done i i was very very impressed with it well you and i both said that it felt like we were watching a yeah, book a book yeah you know the storyline was it yeah. played out it was it was framed up as though you were reading chapters in a book and it yeah really great if you have sort of the same tastes as jeff and i based on other recommendations we've given on the podcast you probably would enjoy the white lotus yeah the next tip i have is just a smile how to be more zen is to smile and you know when they talk about fake it till you make it a lot of times if you smile even if you fake laugh when you're down it can help you can turn yeah. it into real laughter but i'm a huge smiler yeah um would you would you say like that the a large percentage of the people that you surround yourself with are smilers or not so much? I think they are. I think our close friends are smilers. Yeah. I've often heard that if you, when your baby is really young, if you smile at your, your baby, then they tend to learn to smile back as a reaction. And our right. son is definitely a big smiler. Yeah. I've had people who've become irritated with me for smiling. 
Really? I've, had, I've actually had the comment, what are you smiling about? What's there to be so happy about? <laughs> and not in a particular, it wasn't in a situation where it was, no. you know, I should be having a, you know, a very straight face. It was just somebody. Sometimes people just want to bring other people down for no reason. Or sometimes they have a reason, you know, either way, it's, yeah, it's, it's not easy to <laughs> I still keep on take. smiling. Yeah. I want smile, smile lines rather than frown lines. And, you know, the thing, too, is even with masks, I feel like you can tell people are smiling behind their masks through their yeah. eyes. Yeah, I agree. It's, I, it's interesting. One of, these, one of the things about wearing a mask all the time is you do focus on people's eyes a lot more than you would if they weren't wearing a mask, you know? You're right. It's interesting. Lipstick sales are down. <laughs> Mascara sales are uh, up. That's right. That's your hot stock tip. That's right. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, it's uh, when we talk about the idea of masks and, you know, how they sort of cover our facial expressions. There, there are times when I'm quite thankful that my facial expression is covered in certain situations oh, yeah. where I'm kind of like, you know, you're stunned by something that somebody said and you're you're sort of thankful that you can. It, it, it helps with my poker. I don't have a poker face, so a mask helps me have somewhat of a poker face. People's true situations. facial expressions are going to come out once no long once we no longer have to wear masks. Hopefully yes. that there is a day where we don't. <laughs> I hope so. Anyway. I just wonder if you played poker with masks on, what that would look like if it would impact, you know, the people who are really, really great at poker yeah. and they can read, you know, all the tells. And I know a lot of them are more to do with the other parts of your gesturing and such. But I wonder if people wearing masks have has affected their ability to read their opponents. Yeah, quite possibly. Yeah. I don't know what that has to do with Zen, but if I were a Poker's competitive Zen. Poker, poker player and yeah. I was going to lose out on millions because somebody's tell was licking their lips and all of a sudden they had a mask on, I'd yeah. be pretty unzen. That's very unzen. My next tip is just to live simply. And it, this can be simply in terms of how many objects you own, how many people you have in your life, how many activities you have in your schedule. All those things contribute to how you live simply. And we actually did an episode on ways to simplify your life. So if you want to check that out, episode 74. Yes, it w- that was a fun one to do. And I love the idea of simplifying things, even if it's simplifying things to find efficiencies. But, you know, the idea of minimalism, too, is an attractive topic. Which reminds me, we need to revisit KonMari. Oh, we again do. Soon. We do. I think we let things go. We're on con married at the moment. We need to declutter our home. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so Ways to Simplify Your Life, episode 74. And, you know, one of the reasons it's great to simplify your life is that it allows you to focus on what's essential. So spending that time with family and friends, focusing on the activities, the goals, the things that you want to achieve in life. If you remove the excess, you can focus on what is essential. Yes, I agree. Which brings me to another episode that we did on essentialism. A great book by Greg McEwen. And oh, yes. uh, episode 106 was on that. And it was actually one of our most popular uh, episodes. Man, one how of the many most episodes downloaded. have we done? Oh, 100 and something. 100 and something. That's amazing. <laughs> so the whole idea of how to be Zen is really keeping that Zen attitude. The idea that there's no need to rush. And if you think about Gandhi, who's incredibly zen i think most people would say that gandhi always appeared to be quite relaxed he accomplished you know more than most people have in history and without the need to rush but to be focused to be focused on on one thing on one goal and you can accomplish a lot in that you know i a lot of times when things come at me from multiple directions i'll gauge them as to whether or not they're emergencies and a lot of times you know things in life and in my line of work they'll people will come at me with things that they feel are an emergency and oftentimes when it is something that is a relatively high level of urgency the first question I'll ask is before I know the details is everyone okay yes and if the answer is yes then everything else is manageable Mm -hmm. and I think just by asking that question all of a sudden, everybody involved in the conversation gets a little more perspective on what we're dealing with. Even and if uh, some, even if you're in a situation where things aren't okay, you can still be zen about dealing with it. Right. Do you know what I mean? Well, there like, are. I mean, things still deserve a level of urgency. Yeah. But I think if we can remain 
But a certain level of calm, it allows us to make the decisions right. that we need to make and, and yeah. to direct our energies in the appropriate way. If They often say if everything becomes an emergency or everything is treated as a you know top priority, then nothing is a priority, Yeah. right? Because you're, you're treating everything at that heightened level and eventually you burn yourself out. Right. Which is not what we want to do. What we want to finish up with is our random tip. Are you ready with the random tip, Jeff? I don't have a random tip. I am not prepared for it with a random tip. That was tip your one homework on assignment. Zen. Yeah, I know. I just found out what this podcast was about like two or three minutes before we did it. <laughs> I know. Like, like every single other one. Luckily, I have some random tips at hand. My random tips are when you're cutting lemons, keep your eyes shut. When oh, yeah. you're washing a toilet, keep your mouth shut. And when you want to learn from other people... Keep your mouth shut and your ears open. Oh, wow. Those are good. Those are really yeah. good ones, especially the toilet one. Yeah. Like that's, uh, yeah hopefully you, know. you don't have to learn that one the hard way. Yeah, exactly. No one wants like a mouthful of toilet water. The water old toilet thing. spray, yeah. the mist. No, thanks. No, Th- thanks. No, thanks indeed. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Be sure to check out past episodes and subscribe to keep up with what's new. You can find us anywhere you get your podcast. And why not leave a review? You can also follow InfoQuench on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Till Til next time. time.